Hey everybody, this is uh, Perception Day 2. There might be a bit overlap from the last one. Let me rush through some optical illusions because some of you are into this. Keep in mind that hallucinations are when something exists, some, you see or hear something that doesn't exist, like the voices in your head that you know tell you to do something, uh, like if you're schizophrenic or something like that. But an optical illusion is a distortion of the senses. An illusion is when perception overrides sensation. Sensation means that the light goes in your eyes, but perception is what your brain does to it. So this looks like it's moving, but it's not. Even if you pause the video, it should still move just the same. Um, this is another famous optical illusion. If you want to hit pause and look at that, that's fine. And this is the impossible ring. You do not need to know this for the class. Okay. Here's an interesting optical illusion. It looks like we're above a pyramid, but we're not. Every one of these lines are perpendicular, but it looks like it gets bigger in the middle, but it doesn't. Okay. I'll prove it to you. When you vacuum up the smaller squares, then everything starts to look perpendicular. It's crazy. That's weird, but that is an optical illusion. Okay. Same thing here. All of the lines are perfectly straight, but for some reason they look wavy, but they're not. They're perfectly straight. Nothing is moving. It, the almonds look like they're moving, but they're not, I promise you. Same thing here, nothing is moving. If you want to pause and look at this, this is really weird. Uh, it took me like a week for it to work for me, but if you stare at them long enough, Boom, he'll be looking to your left. It's really weird. Okay. All right. So today we're going to spend some time on depth cues. We are three-dimensional characters, but if we, we might look at a two-dimensional paper, like on a computer screen, and, there, and uh, how do you create depth when there isn't? Okay. So if you're in the art, you might like this stuff. Um, now, first of all, I want to, I've only seen her once and I'm thinking about just not teaching her at all, but Eleanor Gibson, um, she did this study. She studied infants, like still crawling. Okay. Uh, do they have depth perception and when, and she created this visual cliff where it was perfectly safe. There was really clean glass, but would the baby crawl across the glass or would the baby say heck no i'm not going to fall and hurt myself like look at that baby the baby is coming to mama but if the glass weren't there and the baby would have looked the baby would have said whoa that's really tall so she studied depth perception in infants and she found that depth perception is innate meaning it's inborn to some certain degree even if you don't need to know Eleanor Gibson, you need to know the word innate. It means nature. You're born with it. All right. So like I said, I've only, um, I've only seen her once and I, you know, it's, but I don't know. I, I teach it anyway, but Eleanor Gibson, visual cliff study, depth perception. Okay. All right. So, we need to talk about depth cues and there's a lot of them and I'll be very careful about which ones that you need to focus on. There are binocular cues, which rely on two eyes. Think by two. And then there's monocular cues, mono one. So with a monocular cue, you could do it with only one eye. Okay. Mono means one, bi means two, okay? So there are two, <laughs> there are two binocular cues that you need to know. These require 
both eyes to work. All right, convergence, write this down. Convergence, I want you to imagine a bug flying around right in front of your face. Now, how do you know that it's a bug flying around in front of your face? Or is it just a really big bug that's like 500 feet away? Well, your brain knows by judging by how much you cross your eyes. If you cross your eyes more to focus in on it, then you know it's close. But if you don't have to cross your eyes then and you can relax, then you know that the object is far away. Imagine this. Imagine somebody is throwing a ball right to your face. And the instant, right as you catch the ball, your eyes cross. That's their way of focusing on how close the ball is. So someone's throwing a ball right at your face. You cross your eyes a little bit to focus on it so you can catch it. That's convergence. And the more you cross your eyes, the more muscles have to work to cross your eyes, the closer the object is to your face. So this is a binocular cue. It requires two eyes to do it. If you only had one eye, you couldn't do this. You're not going to cross one eye. Okay. All right, write this down. So I want, let's analyze the word retinal. Retina is part of your eye. It is the back part of your eye. That is what a retina is. Um, disparity means difference. So if you're in sociology or economics and you're talking about income disparity, you're talking about how different groups make different amounts of money. Disparity means difference. Retinal disparity says that your left eye sees one thing and your right eye sees another. And your brain, the back of your brain, will combine the two images. So really what you're seeing is you have two eyes that are seeing different things, but your brain combines the two and you don't know the difference. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand why this is a depth cue, but I know what retinal disparity is. It's the, your left eye is different than your right eye. That's all I know about retinal disparity, okay? And obviously this is a binocular cue because it requires two eyes. All right, let's try. So this is just a joke. I think a student of mine made this. You know, we made memes one day a long time ago, and he made this. Okay. All right. The ability to identify the direction from which a sound originates is strongly dependent on having two ears separated in space by several inches. By the way, that's true. If a sound goes in your right ear a tenth of a second before it goes in your left ear, then you'll know that the sound is coming from your right. We call that sound localization. The ability to perceive visual depth is related to a similar property known as what? All right, the answer is C, retinal disparity. Okay, so you have two eyes seeing two different things. All right, convergence is a binocular depth cue that is based on the what? The answer is muscular tension that occurs when the eyes cross, turn inward. Okay. What if you only have one eye? If you only have one eye, then you can't do convergence. You can't do retinal disparity. So you are stuck with what are called monocular cues. Mono means one. Remember monotheism, monogamy, one man, one woman, monogamy. Okay. All right. Write these down. 
interposition, I will show you some pictures, but interposition means that if something is blocking your view, there's overlap, then the thing that's blocking your view is closer than the per thing that it's blocking. I'll show you pictures. Relative size. If we know that two objects are similar in size, the one that looks smaller is further away. So imagine looking at a photo of a grown man, but he's, but he's very small on the picture. But you don't assume that he's a dwarf or something. You assume that he's just far away. Okay, that's easier to show you picture-wise. I don't think I've seen relative size on the test, but I have seen interposition. Okay, I want you, now I'll, I'll tell you what I have seen on the test. Motion parallax, I have seen that, and I have seen linear perspective more than once. Write those down. All right, I'll go through the other stuff, but I haven't seen them on the test. If, if you were making a painting or a video game and you make stuff that is further away, make it less detailed, coarser, that's called texture gradient. It's also called relative clarity and visual acuity. The closer something is, the more clear it is. Relative height, things that are higher in our field of vision look further away. So think you're looking out into the ocean. The, if you want to make a ship look far away, you put it higher on the painting. Motion parallax is only when you're moving. When you are moving, things that are closer to you move faster, while things that are further away move more slowly. That is called motion parallax. Notice it has the word motion in it, okay? Linear perspective. I've seen this more than once. Think linear line, line perspective, linear perspective. Parallel lines seem to converge, come together, converge with distance. Think of a railroad track. You see the lines coming together in the distance? That's linear perspective. The, now, so here is a classic optical illusion. We perceive the top yellow bar as being bigger than the bottom yellow bar. But in reality, they're the same size, at least on our retina, on our eye, they are the same size and they are the same size. But we perceive the top one to be bigger. Why? Because linear perspective, the railroad tracks are coming together and our brain assumes that the top line is further away. Our brain assumes that if the top line is further away and it's the same size as the bottom one, our brain makes the calculations that the top line is bigger. But it's not bigger. Okay, so that's linear perspective. Parallel lines seem to converge with distance, come together. Light and shadow, I haven't seen that on the test, but I'll show you. Okay. Relative size, we assume that things that are further away are going to appear smaller. Those are grown men young but grown men so we assume that they're not small we just assume that they're far away okay why does the dog appear closer to be closer to us than the picture why does the dog appear to jump out interposition remember interposition interposition is overlap blocking our view if something is blocking your view then you assume that thing to be closer to you than the thing that's blocking and you should and keep in mind this is a monocular death cube you you can do this with one eye you don't need two eyes here's another one 
Why does that glass of milk seem to be jumping out? Because of interposition it is covering the comment and the share button. So we assume the glass is closer to us than what it's blocking. That's called interposition. Here's one that shows up on the internet about every year or so in my feed. Which building is closer to us? Is it the one on the left or is it the one on the right? I don't clearly know, but why is it hard to determine? It's hard because we can't do interposition. It's hard to do interposition. But if you stare at it long enough, it looks like the building on the left is closer. But the fact that since it's hard to do inter interposition, then it makes it hard to, for, to determine that the left building is actually closer. Linear perspective, lines come together in the distance. Texture gradient, basically the closer it is to you, the more texture you will have, the more coarse things look. But if you look at stuff far away, you're gonna get less detail. Relative height, we assume that this stuff is further away because it is higher on the picture. Motion parallax. When in motion, closer stuff moves faster. And stuff that is further away from you moves more slowly. And this is only when you're moving. I haven't seen this on the test, but light and shadow um, you can give depth with shadow. That blue box on the right, it's not moving. Put your finger on it. It's not moving. But the shadow is. So the shadow gives depth. Look at the balls on the bottom there. The balls don't move, but the shadow does. T a good tattoo uses shadows. There's, this is why you want to save up for, if you're going to get a tattoo, pay good money for it. Because then you'll get good stuff like this. An artist that knows shadow. And if you're wondering, I don't have any tattoos. I'm like the last person of my generation to not have tattoos. I have none. And I'm strange, I know. This guy looks like he's floating because of that because of what looks like a shadow. Okay, all right. This is not an AP question, but in making a charcoal pencil drawing, which pictorial depth cue could you most effectively use with just a charcoal pencil? The answer is light and shadow. Okay. Which balloon is closer? You know the bottom one is because of interposition. It's blocking the other one. All right. Which monocular depth cue is illustrated in the figure above? The answer is linear perspective. Lines like railroad tracks coming together. All right, when viewed from the window of a moving train, nearby objects seem to pass by more quickly than do more distant objects. This cue for depth perception is called what? And the answer is motion parallax. I did see a question on in the bank, on the test bank on stroboscopic motion. That has to do with creating like cartoons with drawings. All right, Jojo injured her eye in an accident and has to wear a patch over the eye while it heals. Which of the following cues would she best 
be able to use to make judgments about the distance objects are from her. All right, here's the hint. Don't choose a binocular cue. She only has one eye. The answer is she can do that with one eye. Similarity and closure are not depth cues. Those are gestalt principles of organization. Okay. A and B, those are binocular cues. You need two eyes to do those. Do not play softball or baseball with, with an eye patch. You will get hurt. Okay. All right, write this down. Phi phenomena. Or it might be phi, but I think it's phi. I don't know my Greek. The phi phenomenon is an illusion of movement created by blinking lights. If lights blink a certain way, then it's going to create an illusion of movement. Right here, you can see that the light seems to be moving from le left, from the left to the right. But there is no movement. It's all in your head. We call that the phi phenomenon. Phenomenon. <laughs> all right. Real quick, answer this one. The answer is the phi phenomenon. Okay. Okay. I've seen questions on shape constancy, color constancy, and uh, size constancy. Basically, they all mean the same thing. In your mind, the shape stays the same, even when the what is presented on your eyeball changes. Like, for example, we know that this door is a rectangle. But we also know that if it becomes a trapezoid, we know that it's still a rectangle, even though a trapezoid appears on our, on our vision. So the shape stays constant, even from different angles and from different distances. Now, size constancy. When something walks away from us or drives away from us, we don't think, whoa, the car's getting smaller. No. When someone walks away from you, you don't think they are getting smaller. We just assume that they're going away. So the size in your mind, rightfully so, in your mind, the size stays the same. We call that size constancy. So we've got shape constancy. The shape stays the same. The size stays the same. And then you've got color constancy. Imagine you're playing with like a red ball and then the lights get really dim. You still perceive it as a red ball, even though the lights are dim. That's color constancy. Okay. So Look, this is a classic illusion, but why does the guy on bottom look smaller than the guy on top? Because of linear perspective. Notice that the lines are converging in the distance. So our brain does the math and thinks that that one is bigger than this one. But the reality is, and you can hold up your finger or your pencil up to this, but this this guy is the exact same size as this guy. He's just copied and pasted. So I put this here thinking that it was size constancy, but it's really more about linear perspective. All right, do this question real quick. The answer is size constancy. Car drives away, it doesn't get smaller. The car stays the same, even in your mind. All right, read that. The answer is size constancy again. Okay. 
All right, read this. I hate this question. Don't feel bad if you missed it, but the answer is... Um, so your perceived distance, your perception of the distance does become smaller because something is approaching you. Something is approaching you. This is a hard one. I, I miss it every time. Okay. All right. Do this question. The answer is... So just like the door opening, if you change the angle that you look at a rectangular table and it, but it ends up being a trapezoid on your eyeball, you still perceive it as being a rectangle. That's shape constancy. All right. Even though it was nearly dark outside, Coco could still tell that the basketball she was playing with was orange. What is this one? The answer is, all right, so we're talking about the orange color of the ball, so it's color constancy. All right, write this down, draw this on your notes, the Mueller liar illusion, the, the two lines are equal length, but this one appears to be smaller than this one, but they are the same length. Why is this illusion? Why does this illusion work? Well, first of all, let me prove to you that it does. The re read this. It turns out that it has to do with people who grew up in rectangular buildings. If you are Mongolian and you grew up in a circular yurt, this illusion would not work for you. But people who grew up in rectangular rooms, this illusion fools us. All right, try this question. It's a little bit weird. The answer is people develop perceptual hypotheses. Hypothesis meaning like educated guess based on experiences in their lives, like growing up in a rectangular house. This is the Ames room, and it's designed to specifically fool you. The person on the right is much closer to you than the person on the left. But the room was designed to make it not look that way. I've never seen that on the test, but it's just interesting. All right, context effects. This is really interesting. I've taught it for years, but I've only seen one question on it. Context effects involves how the surroundings, the context, affects your perception. Which circle, which orange circle looks bigger? The one on the right or the one on the left? Now, some of you have seen this before. You know that they are the same size. If you don't believe me, put your finger up to it or a pencil or something. So the lesson here is that the context matters. Also, you don't need to lose weight. You just need fatter friends. Okay. Here's another one that I thought was interesting. Why do expensive restaurants like to use big plates, but buffets like to use small plates? Because perceptually, the buffets want you to eat less food. But restaurants want you to order dessert and appetizers. They want you to order more food. It's all about money. Remember this from earlier? Um, 
earlier I said that your expectations guide your perception, but here I'm telling you that the context matters. The context of what is surrounding it matters if you see a B or a 13. Context matters. True or false, both center patches are the same shade of gray. The answer is true. They are the same. You want me to prove it? I'll take them away. Boom, they're the same shade. But context matters. Context matters. This one freaks me out every time. But the surroundings would be the shadow. The shadow gives it a certain context and makes it look lighter than it actually is. That's weird. You, Sorry if you've seen this before, but this fits here with context effects better. The reason these balls look different colors is because of the context. But all of these balls are the same color. And this picture, this is a black and white picture, but the context makes it look color. Same thing here, both A and B are the same color, but the surroundings are the context. And it makes it, you perceive it differently. But A and B are the same color. And I know that's crazy, but it's true. If you don't believe me, cover up the middle gap and you'll see they're the same color. All right, answer the question. The answer is, context effects. Perception is a process by which what? The answer is, so this is an overall question. Okay, overall, nothing specific. All right, write this down. All right, so top-down processing. You focus on the big picture, the forest, then the details, the trees. That's why, um, you know, that's why we have perceptual sets sometimes. Because if something fits your schema, then you, you're more likely to notice it if it fits your schema. Top down means you start big, then you work on the small. Bottom up means you start with the details first and then focus on the big picture. So I've got lots of pictures I want to show you. Okay, top down. At first you see a wilderness, but then if you, that's the big picture, but then you start seeing the details. You start seeing the faces. There are lots of faces on here, lots of them. That's top down processing. Top-down processing. At first, you see that it's former President George W. Bush, but then if you zoom in, sorry about that. At this time, please release Hillcrest students to the bus, Hillcrest students to the bus. En este momento, por favor, desviar. I'm sorry about that. Please release Hillcrest students to the bus, Hillcrest students to the bus. En este momento, por favor, desviar. I'm sorry about that. Please release Hillcrest students to the bus, Hillcrest students to the bus. En este momento, por favor, desviar. I'm sorry about that. Please release Hillcrest students to the bus, Hillcrest students to the bus. En este momento, por favor, desviar. I'm sorry about that. Please release Hillcrest students to the bus, Hillcrest students to the bus. En este momento, por favor, desviar. I'm sorry about that. Please release Hillcrest students to the bus, Hillcrest students to the bus. En este momento, por favor, desviar. I'm sorry about Top down, at first you see some dude, then you start seeing every other detail in this picture. A lot of faces. Everything on here is Snoop Dogg. It's top down because at first you see a nature scene, then you start to see that everything on here is Snoop Dogg.
At first, you see a face, that's the big picture, but then if you can read cursive, you'll see that it says liar, L-I-A-R. Sorry, I'm going fast, but the announcements are starting. All right, I hope this works. Bottom up processing would be if you started small, like if you took a bite of stew and you noticed the carrots, you noticed the potatoes, you noticed the details, and then you noticed the flavor of the, all the stew. All right, I have not seen bottom up processing, so I'm not too worried about it. All right, do the question. The answer is top-down processing. You see the overall picture, the big picture, then you notice the details. All right, answer the question. The answer is top-down processing. It's a lot like thinking schema and, ex and, per and perceptual expectancy. You know, it's similar. It's very similar to perceptual set, okay? All right. Read this. The answer is. And that is it for perception day two. Thank you.